Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Garrett Sheehan. I'm the president and CEO of the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce and the Quinnipiac Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we're gonna get started in just a couple of minutes. We are expecting Senator Murphy to join us and we have a great panel here today to go through the federal stimulus package. Um, I know people are just jumping on a few points here. Uh, our expectations for this have already been far exceeded. We just started talking about this uh, webinar last night and we have more than 500 people who have registered to be with us today. Um, so if you or anyone you know has trouble getting on, we are streaming this live on the GNHCC Facebook page. I see we're already up to over 410 people logging on with us. So uh, give us one more minute and then we are going to get started. But again, we have a great panel today. We're expecting Senator Murphy to join us any moment and we will be going over the federal stimulus package. Again, for those of you just joining us right now, we're about to get started. Uh, we're expecting Senator Murphy to join us in just a moment. What we're trying to do here today is have the Senator uh, first speak a little bit about uh, the package overall, answer some of your questions. I know I've received a lot over email already. You can put them into the Q&A box as well, uh, also into the chat box. And the Senator is going to spend some time with us to go through those questions. And then, as I said, we also have a panel of experts who's going to start working through uh, the federal stimulus. And specifically, we're trying to talk more about the CARES Act uh, this afternoon. That is phase three of the federal stimulus plan. That's the one that was finalized in passage on Friday, signed by the president on Friday afternoon. Now, uh, just a disclaimer here. I know everyone wants to understand better how to use that, that loan program, that grant program that's a part of it. The details are still being worked out. As of this moment right now, um, there's very few places where you can actually apply to get on. So we wanna make sure that you understand. Uh, we're just going through the details as we have them, as have been released. Uh, SBA is putting out more and more guidance as we go through. And we also expect to see uh, several of the banks in a position to be able to offer the loans to expedite the process so you can get that money in your hands a lot faster. I know a lot of questions out there, as I said, start putting them into the Q&A box. You can also uh, put them into the chat box. And once we get going, we'll start reading those questions off uh, first to the Senator when we get him online and then to our panel as we get going. I think what we'll do right now is we will start going with our panel and then when we get uh, Senator Murphy online, we'll jump with Senator Murphy. So um, what I'm gonna do right now is introduce each of our panel members, ask them to speak a little bit about the program and the top issue that they're seeing come up. This is really meant to be a, an opportunity for you to ask questions and answers. Um, if we don't have all the answers today, we'll take those down and we'll try to follow up with you. I'm sure we're gonna be doing more of these sessions. So let me start with the Connecticut Small Business Development Center. Uh, we have Joe Ercolano, the Executive Director, and Joe Williams as well. Joe, uh, why don't you kick us off with what you know about phase three. Uh, lots of questions we're getting about the loan program that turns into a grant for small businesses. And Joe, if you could turn up your mic. Okay, can you hear me, Garrett? Yeah, we can hear you, go right ahead. Sorry about that. Little technical difficulty here, but not much. Um, also trying to share some slides. And uh, can you see those slides? Yep, we can see them. Okay, let me just get it in the slideshow so it doesn't show you all the other stuff. How's that? Great. Good. Okay, good, good afternoon, everybody. Joe Ercolano from the Connecticut Small Business Development Center. Joe Williams is my colleague based at the Chamber in New Haven covering Greater New Haven. We have a dozen other advisors around the state. Uh, we are an SBA resource partner funded by the SBA in the state of Connecticut. Our goal is to try to give you the most up-to-date, accurate information possible. I will tell you though that the uh, CARES, CARES Act is in the throes of implementation. Um, it's, it's, some, it's a work in progress. Not all of the detail is out yet. So we wanna just caveat our entire presentation by saying, uh, keep an eye out for more detail and keep an eye out for particularly information about process and application because a lot of that has not yet been published by 
SBA or by any other federal agency uh, to our knowledge. So what do you uh, have options in front of you right now for uh, resources? There's the major big news since Friday uh, with the Congress passing the CARES Act and the president signing it, the Paycheck, Paycheck Protection Program is basically a 7A loan program expanded on steroids and with 100% guarantee from SBA to banks. So um, that's one thing that you might consider. I'll give you a little more detail on that in a couple of minutes. The other has been around for a few weeks now, which is the Emergency Economic Injury Grant, uh, which is a more of a typical disaster program uh, run by SBA with an online application that now has been updated with the passage of the act on Friday to include a $10,000 advance, which you can get immediately, but you must apply for the EIDL program in order to access that. There's also uh, relief on existing SBA loans that you might have, 7A, 504, et cetera. And you can get that, you can inquire about that uh, directly through your lending institution wherever you got that. And if you need help, there's the SBA uh, resource partners, uh, us, Women's Business Development Council out of Stanford and New London and Derby, and um, Women's Business Center out of University of Hartford, and SCORE, which is statewide as well with a robust chapter in New Haven area. Um, so basically just a quick update on what changed with the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program you uh, can now be assured that SBA will base its decision on how much to lend you based on your credit score. And uh, that's a little bit more simplified and streamlined than what was published a week or two ago. Um, but again, um, there will be some len leniency shown. Don't assume your credit score will kick you out of the box until you apply. Um, we can't guarantee, we're, we won't sit here and tell you that you're going to get approved no matter what credit score you have. But SBA has been telling us all along, um, don't, don't predetermine that you won't get in, just apply and see what happens. Um, the other big news is that um, less than a $200,000 loan, you won't need a personal guarantee. Uh, that's, a, that's a change since last week. And um, that makes it a lot easier for a lot of smaller loan amounts to um, be put together and, and applied for. And then finally is the uh, $10,000 emergency cash grant advance that can be forgiven if it's spent on paid leave, maintaining payroll, or increased costs due to supply chain disruption, mortgage or lease payments, or repaying obligations that cannot be met due to revenue losses. The only way we're told that you can get this $10,000 emergency grant is to apply through the EIDL loan program. So once you apply, I, we haven't done it yet because this is all new. We got a new website this morning, literally, from SBA, and um, we haven't been through the process, but we're assuming there is an uh, indicator in there where you can say, yes, I would like the $10,000 emergency grant. We're told that you could apply and get this grant and then may not have to take the entire loan. I'm not 100% certain on that. That's an area of clarification we're looking for from SBA. Uh, as soon as we get it, we'll post it on our website and our advisors will be able to tell you that. But uh, in addition, we're told that um, the, uh, even if you do not get the loan, if you're turned down for credit score reasons, for example, you could still keep the $10,000 emergency cash grant if you're granted that. So by all means, apply. If you need help, we're here to help. Great. Thank you, Joe. Um, Joe Williams, and I, I'll just uh, let everyone know, we do have the senator online. We're just trying to get his uh, microphone popped up. So as soon as uh, we do that, we'll have the senator speak. Uh, Joe Williams, you want to talk a little bit as well on what are some of the issues that you're hearing about most from businesses Again, we're going to jump into the questions, the chat, uh, after we go through this and after we hear from the senator. So keep sending your questions. I'm going to work through all of them. Uh, we want to answer as many of them as possible. This is an information session for everyone. Joe? Hi, Garrett. Thanks. Most of what I'm getting, especially as of, the, as of this morning after the CARES Act was approved, is the confusion um, between the portal of the EIDL that we had in the last two weeks 
uh, the new information that is in the act um, regarding the PPP program, the actual two grant opportunities of the $10,000 and how that will be played out. Like Joe alluded to, um, as of right now, we do not know exactly how to request um, the grant or the PPP. That information is gonna be forthcoming. We did get a, a memo sent to us an email this afternoon indicating that they should get information disseminated to us out in the field in the next couple of days. Hopefully we'll get that by Wednesday and we'll get that to you. Um, what I'm finding with most small businesses, especially in the New Haven uh, County area and all the way down to, to Fairfield County, are one, those who have applied for uh, loans in the previous portal, when they the originally came out with EIDL, if you did not hear back yet from the SBA, as far as them receiving your application or the processing application, more than likely you have an incomplete application and you will need to apply to the new application portal and that process. Um, you are not allowed to go backwards and to resubmit anything to the old or original that's been out before the CARES Act of Friday. So if you have not gotten an email or no one has sent you any word from your application, it is probably likely that is incomplete and no one is looking at it. And more likely, based on the correspondence that we've had this afternoon, that you will need to apply at the new portal. So I do recommend that to do that. Also, what I'm finding out, a lot of people are trying to ask a question about their employees, um, especially those under 50 employees of trying to find out whether or not the leave act and the sick leave will apply to them and what best way to move forward. I was on a call earlier today at 12 with the non nonprofits talking about that as well. And we'll have a little webinar about that later this week once we get further information um, regarding that. So pretty much, you know, stay tuned. Um, this is an ever evolving um, operation, as you know, you know, as of Friday, once the act was approved, we now are on Monday morning. We yet, as George alluded to, we have not yet fully implemented the new system of taking our clients directly to it. We're actually going to do that right now as we presently speak. So stay tuned, stay informed. We will definitely let you know as soon as we get that information, we'll definitely send it out to you guys directly. Okay, great. Um, hey, Dan, let's uh, go to Dan Schwartz, who's a partner with Shipment and Goodwin, uh, specifically dealing with employment, because Dan, I know one of the big questions is if you've already laid off employees, and this new phase of the federal stimulus is calling for you to keep your employees in place. What do you do? And I'm sure you're fielding a lot of questions on that. Yeah, and we're still trying to, to make some sense of that. There's a provision in there that talks about that you'll be able to get some relief uh, and the penalties won't apply if the employees are brought back um, by, uh, by June 30th. There's some question as to, uh, does that mean you need to bring them back so, you know, before you apply for the loan or not? Um, we're still working our way through the CARES Act, a good 800 page uh, document. Uh, that's there. Um, the other questions that we are hearing about really, I mean, and, and it goes to that, which is, should we be doing furlough? Should we be doing layoffs? Um, how is that going to apply for the, um, the paid sick leave provisions of the um, uh, FMLA plus and the uh, EPSLA. Uh, so we're hearing uh, those questions as well. And then over the weekend, we got some additional guidance um, about when small businesses may claim the exemption to the paid sick leave and have a test on there um, as well. So uh, the DOL over the weekend uh, for those businesses 50 and younger, uh, when the providing of, of paid sick leave to care for a child um, would be too much of a um, of a concern to a business. It gives the uh, employers in that case uh, uh, three questions that they can really ask whether uh, the provision of that paid sick leave would exceed the available business revenues, whether the absence of that employee would entail a substantial risk to, to the financial help. Uh, and I'm going to pause you for one. Moment. Yeah, no, go ahead, please. We do have the senator online now. Sarah Murphy, can you hear us? All right, we can see you, Senator Murphy. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, great. Thank you, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. We appreciate it. We've got 
457 people uh, online, almost all of them businesses were on Facebook Live. And as you know, lots of questions about the stimulus package. Uh, we appreciate everything that you've done on it for business and wanted to have this opportunity to hear from you. So thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Garrett. Um, I, uh, I, I know I was interrupting my good friend, Dan, and uh, he uh, and Joe, uh, and you can uh, much better service to the details and implementation than I can, but I did uh, want to take you up on the opportunity to just at least be able to stop by uh, during this webinar to say uh, thank you for uh, being such active participants in what admittedly uh, has been a very rushed right by small businesses uh, and the, um, the greater business community in Connecticut. Uh, this is obviously a um, hopefully once in a lifetime uh, moment for us in Connecticut. And we knew that time was of the essence. Thus, we, in about a week's period of time, put together a $2 trillion assistance package. And um, in many ways, I think it will scratch us where we itch, but there are going to have to be adjustments uh, along the way uh, as we um, implement this. As you all know, there were several major components to the um, CARES Act. Um, obviously, we knew we had to supersize unemployment benefits. We did that $600 additional per week and an extension of four months over the, the normal period of time. Uh, we got a cash payment out to families, not as big as I would have liked, uh, nor as big as I proposed, um, but it will help a lot of families be able to balance their books at least for a month or so. Uh, and then the hope is that that um, expanded unemployment benefit, along with the provisions that you're talking about here today, uh, the emergency grants uh, to businesses, the forgivable uh, loans to businesses, and then the job retention tax credit, um, are going to be able to keep a lot of businesses whole throughout this period of time. Now, I understand every business is in a different position right now, and that's why we tried to tailor this in a way that was flexible. There are a lot of folks who um, had to lay off or furlough employees. There are others that tried to hold on and keep people um, on staff, some who laid off part of their staff and kept on others. There are businesses that are still open. There are those that are closed. Um, and, and so what's really important uh, for from a policymaker standpoint is that uh, as you start to interact with your SBA lender, uh, as you start to interact with the IRS, um, that you just keep an open line into our office. And that can happen directly through David Tusio in my uh, office, who is um, uh, who sort of is my liaison to the business community, works all of our federal grants, um, or through the chamber. I mean, we rely on the chamber um, to filter certain priorities up to us. Uh, and I was on the phone with chamber executive directors right in the middle of the debate and passage of this uh, legislation. Uh, and so uh, I have no doubt that there is going to be a fourth package. Uh, I mean, we are um, not yet to the peak of infections. I unfortunately have confidence that even as we in the Northeast may be able to bend the curve and turn the corner in the you know, next 30 days, um, I unfortunately think that places like Texas and Arizona and Florida are going to be sort of coming into the works, this is going to go in waves all across the country and unless there is a, a deep sensitivity of this virus to warmer temperatures and we just don't know the answer to that yet. And so um, I don't have any doubt that there's going to be a fourth uh, assistance package, that's my belief, and there will be new provisions in that legislation, but there will also be adjustments that we will make on the fly as we learn um, what we did right and what we did wrong. Admittedly, we wrote this very quickly. Um, and uh, we're going to need we're going to need help in making sure that we do it right. Um, as many of you know, um, I, in about a 24 period of time, with some of your help, um, uh, authored a proposal, the Main Street Emergency Grant Program, uh, that I thought was better tailored than the version we passed, uh, because my uh, version would have been grants rather than loans. Um, the um, version that we ended up passing, which is forgivable, which is you know basically forgivable loans. Um, I understand why we did it. Um, the SBA program already has lenders in place. You have relationships with those lenders. The feeling was that that money could get out the door much faster. Um, but time will tell whether a loan structure versus a grant structure was the better way to go. Um, so listen, I just wanted to get on the call very quickly today to say thank you for all of your input. To continue to provide it to me directly, to feed it 
uh, through um, Garrett and the chamber as well. Um, you know, this is a you know very very unique national crisis in that there are federal responses that are necessary in order to meet this moment. Um, but there is no way that you can um, counteract the public health crisis uh, without all of us making individual decisions that collectively will lead us to turn the corner. If we don't all get truly serious about social distancing and emergency measures, then there is no amount of economic stimulus that will fix this problem. This is an economic catastrophe created by a public health catastrophe. And so if you don't create the public health, if you don't fix the public health crisis, then there's nothing you can do on the economic side um, that will save us. And so um, as proud as I am of the titles in this bill, which provide economic assistance to you and to your families and to Connecticut residents. Um, I am frankly spending much more of my time right now on the public health response. And so much of my day today is caught up in trying to make sure that the supply chain is flowing to hospitals and healthcare providers, trying to force this administration to federalize the manufacture and supply of critical medical equipment, and then trying to figure out how we take these breakthroughs on testing um, recently announced in the last 48 hours that will allow hospitals to be able to test in a matter of minutes rather than what we have today, which is shipping tests out to private labs and getting the results back days later. That is a breakthrough, it's a game changer, but you have to be able to scale that up and distribute it very, very fast. If you're able to do all that alongside the public health measures, then, then I do see a 30 to 60 day period of time where we can turn the corner and get into a period of time where we can be reopening. Um, but that can't happen unless we all make decisions that are smart in our personal lives and our business lives. And that can't happen unless we have the facilities to allow you to stay open or stay in a position where you can reopen. And, and that's what we hope this package of unemployment benefits and small business assistance does. Um, but as you discussed that today with the true experts, um, I hope that you'll just um, keep in mind my invitation to uh, stay in touch. So um, thank you very much for allowing me to respond to the call today. Uh, Senator, if you don't mind, I'll just ask you a couple of questions. And uh, we're having a little problem with the audio, so if you can stay close to your computer, it seems to be uh, best then. Um, you, you just mentioned you've been working a lot with the healthcare workers right now. Uh, where do we stand in Connecticut in our ability to be able to uh, deal with the crisis that is growing exponentially each day right now from a hospital standpoint? Yes, yeah, so um, I have uh, been on the phone with the administration in the last several days. Um, trying to press them to federalize the manufacture and supply of critical medical equipment. As you know, we have scaled back testing in Connecticut because we don't have enough personal protective equipment in order to cover both our inpatient capacity and our drive-through testing facilities. Now, if you don't test, you cannot effectively counteract the virus because we really should be testing not only people who are symptomatic, but also anybody that has been in contact with someone who uh, has tested positive. And we don't have the, the, the capacity to do that right now. The only way to do that is for the federal government to take control of manufacture, testing, and distribution, make sure that the tests get where they need to be. Right now, there is incentives for both gouging and hoarding. We frankly don't know where all the PPE is in this country. Um, there, it could be that states that don't have high rates of uh, COVID have plenty of PPE and they're holding on to it um, instead of making sure that it's in the, the hot spots like Connecticut. So we have made some progress with the administration, um, but not uh, enough. Um, the next step is to make sure that we get these dollars down to the state and hospitals as quickly as possible. This package has $100 billion for hospitals and healthcare providers. Um, we need that in the hospital's hands, ASAP. Uh, and two, we need that state and municipal money um, because we are just running out of dollars in order to um, be able to invest in the public health program fund um, uh, out of a, a, from, from the state and from the municipal uh, standpoint. So um, that's where our focus is right now, trying to continue to push the administration on personal protective equipment and tests and to get dollars into the state and local governments and the hospitals to be able to continue to uh, to run this response. 
I know one of the big questions we're going to have today, and, and there probably is not a good answer yet, but when do you think that a business that applies can see money uh, into their account so that they can continue their operations? As you just mentioned, you know, cash is king. There's a cash flow issue uh, for so many of our businesses. Well, it, it, you know, just so everybody knows, and I'm sure you'll go over this, this is, um, this is not an entitlement, right? So this is an appropriation, which means um, there is a limited amount of money in this fund. There's $370 billion in the forgivable loan fund. Um, we frankly don't know how far that will go. Uh, and so, well, I, well, I think there is willingness to go back and appropriate more money. Um, should we start to see uh, the trough run dry, you know, inside the next 30 days. Um, it is important to know that if you think you qualify to get in touch with your SBA lender soon, um, because there is going to be a limit on this crunch of money. And I had proposed $600 billion. Um, this bill has $370 billion. That obviously is a lot of money, but when you consider the broad base of eligibility, um, you know, I'm just not sure how far it will go and, and, and how wide we can spread. So um, I don't, so it's really up to the lender um, how quickly they can get the money out. They are being backed up with money from the federal treasury and, and the treasury is literally setting up that facility as we speak. So we will press treasury to set up the facility for lenders um, as quickly as possible. Hopefully this week, I would press you to get in line with your lender as quickly as possible. Um, but then understand that if we do see this running dry, I hope and I trust that there is willingness in Washington to come back and appropriate another uh, another sum. Um, thank you. And and Sarah, you did mention phase four, which is being worked on right now. Can you just go into some depth about uh, things that you really want to see happen in that bill uh, that would impact business? Uh, Sure. Well, again, I think one of the things we will have to come back, we, one of the things we have to do is come back and make adjustments to the small business program. And so I just want to, you know, once again, reiterate that, um, you know, I think we've done as good a job as we could in a short amount of time for an unprecedented program, but we'll need to take your feedback uh, and adjust. Um, we don't have enough money in that legislation right now uh, for, um, for the protective equipment that I'm talking about. Uh, so I think we may have to come back and appropriate specific dollars uh, for the purchase of these new testing devices that can develop on our labs um, and uh, others. That is likely a, a component of, a, um, uh, of the next package uh, as, uh, as well. Um, so, you know, and then one of the, what we didn't do here is appropriate some of the state-based dollars on a need basis. Um, and you've heard Governor Cuomo in particular criticize that uh, out of the bat. We will also have to sort of look in a fourth package um, at whether we need to tailor some relief dollars to um, particular parts of the country, which we didn't do here. We spread the unemployment benefits and the state stabilization funds pretty evenly across the country, um, just not knowing where the virus is going next. You know, three weeks from now, a month from now, we may have a better sense of where it is, and we can tailor dollars a little bit more precisely. Um, I, I'll, I'll wrap it up with this question, and uh, I know all of our businesses are uh, glad to know that this money is available right now. Um, we do have we have started to hear some questions about what do we as a do as a country once we've gotten through the virus. We know we're going to get there eventually, um, and you know we are spending these huge sums of money, which uh, is really important right now, but what does that mean for our government going forward? Well, I mean, I think the jury is still out on how this is going to change us as a country. I don't think there's any doubt that we are going to be different and our practices are going to be different. Um, and perhaps uh, business will look different when this is over. Um, you know, remember about a week and a half ago, nobody was talking about a grant program to small businesses. I mean, all we were talking about was, you know, perhaps engaging in some low interest loans for business. Um, but when we started to go out and talk to our small business community, in particular, um, we started to hear the reality of what was happening, which was a mass extinction event. You know, the uh, if small businesses go under right now, there are 
quasi monopolies um, just ready to gobble up that business. And so, well, I think that will still happen to an extent. I mean, I, we all know there are going to be some businesses that will not reopen um, at the end of this crisis. We already were in an environment where it was harder than ever before to start up a business, right? We have record low levels of startups today in this economy. Um, and it is just much harder to compete with these just, you know, mega businesses that um, have been able to just grow share of market after market. And so what I hope happens at the end of this is that, you know, we take a step back and ask ourselves some really hard questions um, about why we continue to give such massive advantages uh, to these big market players and why we make it so hard for small businesses to succeed and for individuals to begin businesses. Um, it just doesn't make any sense that these giant guys pay no corporate taxes, whereas the amount of uh, obligation to pay tax to state, local, and federal government for a small startup business can put you under. Um, we're going to have to take a broader step back on the regulatory barrier to small business. I think we're going to have to really have a broader assessment about how we create more and more winners um, rather than a very narrow set of winners um, because that trend line, which was already heading in one direction, will be exacerbated by this crisis. And you know, count me as someone who wants to be uh, a big part of that conversation going, uh, going forward. Uh, I think it's more important going forward than ever before. Senator, we uh, appreciate you taking the time to speak with us, and, and I know we're going to have more feedback that's coming from the businesses, so we'll definitely take you up on feeding that information uh, to you in your office. Great. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate you letting me jump on today. Thanks a lot. Um, we're going to continue on with the panel. I know uh, the questions uh, are really uh, starting to line up, so um, let me... Uh, give the floor to Mike Daddio with Markham uh, for just a minute, talk about some of the issues uh, that he's seeing, and then we're just going to start working through these questions. Uh, we are recording this, so we'll make it uh, available. And again, we're on Facebook Live right now, too. Mike? Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Garrett. I, I, uh, I think most of the questions that we've been fielding from a tax perspective deals clearly with the tax provisions in the CARES Act, particularly certain business provisions the ability now to carry back net operating losses from 2018, 19, and 20 for five years without there being any limitation on the use that was imposed on losses from the uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And that's going to produce immediate uh, refund claims that hopefully will get some cash back. Similarly, the uh, limitation on business losses for non-corporate taxpayers has been suspended for 18 through 20 Again, the possibility of a refund claim. The immediate ability to take corporate AMT credits, which was deferred over four years going out to 2021. Now you can take them in 18 and 19. Actually, if you haven't filed your 19 return, you can amend your 18 to do that. And an increase in the ability to take business uh, interest expense deduction from uh, the limitation that was uh, imposed previously. Although there is a special rule for partnerships and it's just a gigantic correction of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the ability for qualified improvement property, which basically for commercial property is uh, work that's done to the interior of the, uh, the property, to be able to write that off immediately, as opposed to uh, uh, depreciating it over 39 years. Uh, and obviously for individuals, uh, the cash rebate, which is the publicized part of the bill, the ability to get 1200 a person or 2400 for a married couple and $500 extra for a dependent child who's uh, under 17. Some pension plan rules have been liberalized, including uh, the suspension of having to take required minimum distributions uh, for 2020, particularly when the market's down, that would mean you don't have to sell out a position in order to make a distribution. And from uh, an employer side, uh, there's a payroll tax deferral on the employer's share of Social Security tax. That's the 6.2% the employer pays on wages. That can be deferred until the end of 2021 and the end of 2022 paid 50% each year. And there's an employee retention credit 
a 50% of qualified wages that are paid uh, up to $10,000, so a $5,000 credit, 10,000 of wages uh, for uh, uh, taxpayers. But those particular benefits, the payroll tax deferral and the employee retention credit cannot be taken if you're participating in the SBA uh, loans that uh, provide uh, forgiveness. So as an employer, you have to consider which path you want to go down, trying to take the loan out or getting the uh, uh, employment-related benefits. So, uh, Mike, my takeaway already is it's very complicated. Um, and, you know, again, we're going to be pushing more information out, um, you know, in, in forms and, and, and different types of uh, delivery methods to get it out to you because <clears throat> There are a lot of complications, as Mike was just mentioning. There's a difference of whether some of those tax relief items are available to you um, if you take the SBA loan or if you don't. Um, one thing I want to pick up on first, and we'll start going through the questions now, um, and we'll kind of try to do rapid fire on these to get through as many as possible. Uh, the senator said this, this fund for small businesses uh, has the potential to run out, so time is of the essence. Uh, Joe and Joe, uh, maybe you want to jump on that because uh, that's the first time I've really heard that clearly said that uh, they're, they're, the fund itself could run out. Yeah, Gary, well, that's kind of true. I mean, here being local in the state of Connecticut with Governor Lehman, uh, I mean, Governor Lamont and Commissioner Lehman, you know, we started with $25 million and what the 24 hours, we had over 2,800 applications, and that's understanding that's now doubled and we've increased it to 50 million. So as Senator Murphy has alluded to, definitely this is time is of the essence um, as far as you applying for, um, definitely go to the website and, and seek out the vice um, to actually move that forward. I mean, like you said, he asked for 600 billion, they can end up 370 billion. If you know how many small businesses are in the United States, you know, it's a really significant. And you have to look at the factors that a person or a business can apply it up to $2 million. So there are a sizable number of small businesses and look at the classification of what the SBA looks at small business. We're looking at 500 employees or less, which you know can be significant. If you look at it, most people say, hey, is that small business? No, that is small business from the federal standards. Um, so that, that money may go relatively quickly over the next 30 days. So Joe, here's, here's the follow on and, and maybe Joe or Colano can jump on this. So what should businesses start doing today? Because we just got everyone in a panic uh, that the dollars are gonna run out. Um, what should they be doing after they get off this webinar? Because frankly, right now you cannot apply. So how do you get yourself most prepared? How do you get most prepared? Well, the new yeah, website, ahead, the new website is up and actually up and running as of today um, since the CARES Act. I mean, the one that was over two weeks ago, the EIDL, was actually in place. Um, there was a number, number of problems. It was crashing. A lot of people couldn't get on. They were having problems with uploading documents and things. So hopefully the new website, the new portal, new methodology has solved a lot of that problem. So I, I would encourage everyone to go to the disaster website right now and then just to simply apply. There, what I like about the new website, there are instructions directly on the first page of the website. It answers a lot of questions even before you do apply that you can actually look at. So that's very useful as, as well. I also encourage you to come to our website at ctsbdc.com and utilize one of the 13 business advisors. We'll help you walk you through the process of actually applying. Uh, many times I spend most of my day just talking through with each employer what you actually need. You know, really thinking about it from taking it from 2018, what happened in 2019, whether you applied or not, and looking forward, how has this uh, COVID virus really you know, hindered your business, whether you are were mandatory to close, whether you're still open, whether you furloughed or laid off employees, how are you really impacted? And looking forward, the next three, four, maybe six months, how can we best, you know, utilize the situation that you have and the opportunity that you have and the resources? Joe, um, so are you telling us right now, though, that you can go to the website uh, and apply for the uh, new loans that uh, have the potential to become grants uh, that were approved on Friday. So you can start that application process the, right now? The, the issue right right now, we're working for, we're working for correspondence for the PPP right now. On um, part of what Joe was talking about, the $10,000, there is something on the website that you actually can check on a box. The other portion, we're still waiting correspondence on right now. 
But for those, all the clients that I've had that I think I had like three or four today, they're talking about they haven't heard anything. I do believe those were caught into the shuffle of not being able to be complete. The key thing was having a complete application before it will go into the review cycle. What I found out is many people have found themselves not in the review cycle and it's been a week, week and a half. And now they're finding out, hey, I cannot go back, upload document, you have to go through the new system and the new portal. That's what's key. Okay, so you can still apply right now for those SBDC or SBA loans uh, that are available. 10,000 of that uh, can be uh, given as a grant, the rest is a loan, but we are still waiting on the application process for the payroll uh, grants that could come along. We expect those to be worked through banks and other financial institutions uh, as well as SBA, but that information is not up there. I just want to be clear on that point for everyone. So um, let's let's dive into a little bit more of the payroll uh, forgiveness program. This is the uh, CARES Act that was passed on Friday, phase three, um, and I'll rapid fire on some of these questions. Um, is health insurance an expense that is allowed to be a forgivable expense? Anyone want to jump on that? Sure, Kalana, you hear that? Uh, can you hear me? Yep, now we can hear you. Okay, good. Um, you know, what I have as far as my information about what is an eligible expense, uh, if I can just show this uh, slide, um, if you don't mind. No, go right ahead. So basically, the um, payroll costs, uh, you can use the loan to pay payroll costs payroll costs related to continuation of group healthcare benefits during periods of paid sick, medical or family leave and insurance premiums. Salaries, commissions or similar compensations, payments of interest on any mortgage obligation, which shall not include any prepayment of or principal of or payment of principal on a mortgage obligation. Rent, including rent under a lease agreement, utilities and interest on any other debt obligations that were incurred before the covered period, which is the period where you were impacted by this situation. So the answer, I guess, is yes. And this is not, again, formal final word from SBA um, or from Treasury, but it is fairly reliable information uh, from uh, a website. So that's what I know, that's what we know as of now. Um, let me jump to Dan now. Uh, Dan, uh, lots of questions on employment um, and what you should do if you had to let go of your employees uh, a, a few weeks ago, last week. I know we, you started touching on us before the center uh, joined in, um, but also a question of, you know, especially now that we know that maybe not everyone's going to be able to tap into this uh, paycheck protection program. Uh, is it worth it for the employer to hold on to their employees as they try to find out if they're going to be approved? Yeah, and, and I think on that issue, it really comes down to math, which is, you know, this Payroll Protection Act is really designed to give you a loan of about two and a half months of payroll. Um, so it's designed to keep you going during this time, but it may make, and, and you know, there are going to be loan forgivenesses that are available. Uh, you know, the, I think the 4% uh, interest rate. Um, but it might make sense for your business, particularly if you're not having the cash flow come in, particularly if you don't see uh, this turning around in the next three months, six months out, uh, that there are other options available. Uh, the good thing on this act now is it increases the unemployment compensation available to those people that you lay off and even to those that you furlough. So a furlough sort of keeps them on the payroll per se, you're not paying them, uh, but they're allowed to recoup uh, unemployment. Um, and it really almost doubles it. Um, I'm simplifying it, but but doubles the unemployment and extends it out uh, another 13 weeks on the back end. So um, there was also a question I saw up there about sort of if you reduce someone hours, uh, does this act have any influence on this? And the answer is yes, the act provides for some increased unemployment compensation uh, for those people whose hours are reduced uh, about that in Connecticut. It also has a shared work program uh, that we've seen increased interest on as well that you can go to their website on. So uh, I, I think 
you know, before they make any decisions about rehiring someone, uh, or, or you really got to do the math and work, I think, with your accountant to figure out whether the loan really will make sense. Um, and that's a good point. Let me just uh, ask Joe or Galano this. Joe, we, we can get those slides out to everyone. I'm getting a lot of questions about that. And I think that'll help with the, the math problem of being able to kind of add up what that loan uh, forgivable as a grant could look like um, and what the value would be. Uh, Garrett, I'd like to just get a little more clarity from SBA on these, okay. but we'll, we'll publish them as soon as we do on our website. Um, and again, not to keep sounding like I'm pitching, but there is a lot of information on our website. Um, the COVID-19 resource, business resource center, uh, which includes um, and will include, which includes an EDI, EIDL guide, the work share guide, uh, shared work guide, I'm sorry, and then PPP, the Payment Protection and, uh, Program will be front and center um, in the near future, as maybe as early as tomorrow, as with whatever we know. But we want to make sure that it's information you could, pardon the expression, take to the bank. And sorry to keep clarifying, but I just want to make sure everyone understands there's a couple of programs here. There's more than a couple of programs, but the two that are most prominent are the Economic Injury Disaster Loans. Those were first available. Those are available uh, on a regular basis, but they were uh, pumped up uh, over the last week and a half. Um, that is where that $10,000 grant uh, advance uh, comes into play. And then the other program we're talking about is the Paycheck Protection Program. That's the new program that was part of the bill passed on Friday. And that's not going to be, we don't have the availability for you to apply right now yet. That is where a lot of these details are still being worked out, but that's what Dan was just talking about where it comes into an issue uh, factoring in uh, your costs of labor and all the other items that could become part of a grant through that loan program. So let me go back to the economic injury disaster loans. Uh, Joe and Joe both referenced that you can apply for these right now. A question here about if you already requested a loan uh, over a week ago, um, can you still get that $10,000 advance emergency grant? You know, we're not 100% certain about how the SBA wants you to do that. We've read everything from you have to reapply under the new application, which is online as of today. Um, but that may not be entirely so. So if you've already completed your application and submitted it, um, I would call customer service. Quite honestly, I think you'll get a quicker answer from the SBA customer service line, which is on their website. Um, and on our website, and you could put the question directly to them. If you haven't completed your original EIDL, stop from, if you did it on the old website as of last week, stop it. What you're doing, don't proceed. Go to the new website and start over. That's what we're told to do. And, uh, you know, capacity is a big issue. I mean, uh, the SBA, I can only imagine, is taking this from all across the country, and then add to that that I'm sure their own offices are dispersed. I mean, do they have, are you guys seeing right now that they have the capacity to answer questions, take in these, these loans? Um, yes and no. <laughs> the, yeah. the, 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 the Office of Disaster Assistance is not based in, in uh, it's only based in two regional areas, Atlanta on the east, and I forget where on the west, but they do have a fairly large staff. Now, SBA in the very first bill was given an additional 30 or $40 million to hire people to deal with what was available at that time. In the CARE, CARES Act, there's even more money for SBA. So they're staffing up ra rather quickly. And they, I believe within a matter of days, there will be more capacity, much more capacity than they've had over the last couple of weeks. And this is why the banks are uh, going to be involved as well to uh, you know, supersize that uh, amount of ability to process these loans and get them out to people more quickly. Again, it's just taking a little bit of time. I know everyone who's on the line right now, uh, time is not something that you really have uh, to wait for this, uh, especially with so many questions up in the air. Um, I, I think I can answer this question, but I'll just throw it out there and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, if you're taking advantage of the SBA uh, economic injury disaster loan, that does not preclude you from doing the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, what will happen, though, is you, you can't essentially double dip. So 
Uh, you can't take the grant on the injury disaster loan and then get the full grant. Uh, those two will just be morphed together uh, and you'll be in the same position had you applied for uh, just the Paycheck Protection Program. Correct, guys? Correct. Okay. Yeah. And, and just, Garrett, real quick, the Paycheck Protection Loan portion, Program is um, basically a 7A program, as I mentioned earlier. So you could start having a conversation with your bank today about um, what, it, what they're going to do to take your application for the um, SBA 7A, aka the P P PPP program, because it's, it's going to be treated as a 7A loan, basically, with extra protections for the banks, the lenders. So all of the SBA uh, banks and, and many others will um, be prepared to be having a conversation with you sometime this week. Um, Joe, can you get up on your screen maybe that phone number for customer service uh, to the SBA? You know, I want to mention you know, we have an accountant online, we have an attorney online, we have Connecticut SBDC, um, there's banks who I know, uh, we have many of our bankers who are part of the chamber uh, who have joined us today uh, because we're getting a lot of questions about who do I turn to for help? Well, there really is a lot of people. Now, not everyone has the answers right now, um, but what you're looking for is a trusted advisor that can help kind of uh, steady you through this. So for so many of you that may be an attorney that you work with, maybe an accountant, maybe your loan officer at the bank, uh, at the very least, and Joe's pulling it up right now, um, it's calling into SBA. Again, we, we don't know how long uh, that's going to take to get through on the phone lines, uh, not trying to steer people to an endless uh, hold on a phone call. Um, but this is a good source, as Joe was just mentioning. Right. So it's 800-659-2955 is the customer service center at SBA. That's where you can ask about your EIDL loan and if you need to resubmit if you've already submitted and you did not request or you could not request a $10,000 cash advance. Uh, Dan, quick question here. Um, if, you know, we're talking about the baseline that uh, SBA is going to use, what if an employee uh, resigns during this period of time? Is there uh, some kind of exception uh, to deal with that? Obviously, that wouldn't be the fault of the employer, but um, just in how they are judged for being able to get the full grant. Yeah, we don't we don't have any uh, all the full details yet, um, but I don't, I don't suspect that resignations are going to have much of an impact uh, on this, so long as it's a, a true resignation and not an employer saying, "Well, you should resign instead of me laying you off." So, I think throughout this whole process, as with any loan, I think uh, honesty and um, being upfront about things is is, is critical, uh, not only to get your loan approved, but also to get you the forgiveness uh aspects that uh that you're going to want on this i should also mention one other thing that came out which is um and i know um markham talked about some of the tax credit there's also a um a tax credit that's going to be available uh as an advance on uh so you can take an advance of the, of the payroll tax credit uh if you're doing any paid leave uh under the um the FMLA plus or the uh, emergency paid sick leave act. So if you're gonna be one of those businesses that, that uh, has to do that, take a look at those uh, tax credit provisions uh, as well. We're still getting the details, but uh, the, the guidance I saw over the weekend suggested uh, that there may be an advance available as well. Uh, Mike, let me turn back to you on that. Uh, sounds like significant changes in the tax law, at least for the time being. and. Uh, how those are applied. Let's start off just with the first basic. Um, businesses do not have to get their filings in uh, for April 15th. If, am I correct? That date has uh, been moved? Yeah, IRS moved the uh, filing dates that would otherwise be due April 15th to July 15th, both filing and payment dates. However, if you have, let's say, a fiscal year corporation whose return filing date would be May 15th, that has, as of yet, not been extended. So that would actually be due on May 15th. And in a really kind of crazy rule, when they extended the 415 deadline, they also extended the first estimate that would be due April 15th to July 15th. But the second estimate would be due June 15th. That has also not been extended. So technically, 
you may owe your second estimate before you owe your first, and so as to avoid a underpayment penalty. Now, when Connecticut made its move of the date and filing date and payment dates, it included both the first and second uh, estimates for individuals out to July uh, 15. So there is a difference between the state and federal rule there. Gotcha. A um, couple more questions here. Um, it, maybe a little bit on some of the conditions for the SBA loans to be forgiven. I know we've talked a lot about uh, it's the keeping the employees. Uh, Joe and Joe, any other conditions people should be aware about as they start to go through this? Obviously, before you sign on the dotted line, you want to make sure uh, you understand all of those conditions. Uh, it doesn't hurt to apply and then uh, change your mind before you accept the loan. Um, but any other conditions we should talk about? Joe, if you want to unmute there. Joe or Galano, we can't, can't hear you right now. Unmute you. Okay, Joe. Uh, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yeah, now I can so hear you. This, can you see this slide, Paycheck Protection Program? Right. Yep. Okay. So, apologize. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, is it still there, or is it something else? Yeah, it's still there. I got it. Okay. So, you know, this forgiveness thing um, is is really a little more complicated than it's than you can make out. Um, and I got to tell you, we haven't got our head wrapped around it entirely. But um, it's it's going to be based on follow your payroll costs incurred over an eight week period. One of the things to keep in mind is that everything we've read is that for the Paycheck Protection Program loan, which is forgivable, you must have eight weeks of payroll covered. And I'm not sure, you can go back to April, February 15th for that payroll to start, but if you shut your doors, say on March 20th, I'm not sure how you will continue to show eight weeks of payroll. Um, Perhaps uh, Dan has any thoughts on that or, or some other folks on the line, but um, that's one thing that has to be answered and we don't have an answer right now. Um, but it is um, a little bit more complicated. Payroll, um, you know, is, is the main part of what, what is forgiven, um, but there could be other expenses as well. There's gonna be documentation um, and there's a lot more detail on this that um, we just haven't had the ability to wade through yet, so I apologize. Dan, anything you want to uh, jump in on there? No, I think Mike mentioned it before that I think if there's shutdown or partial shutdown, uh, there's a, a, an employee retention tax credit that may be available, but it's not available if you take the loan. So um, that's about as much information as we've been able to digest over the last 48 hours. But um, I think businesses that have already shut down or done a partial shutdown need to um, really wade in over the next couple of days to figure out how much they're going to be able to take advantage of. I think where this helps is the businesses who haven't yet made that decision, they're going to be in a, in a better position to start with to say, well, look, I can take this pay, Paycheck Protection Act program uh, and hold on for, um, for the next little while without having to make that, uh, make that decision. Well, uh, similar question. We've got some businesses who just, you know, unfortunately just started uh, in the last, uh, you know, two weeks, month. Uh, they don't have that uh, history uh, to rely on for the program. Anyone want to jump on that? Well, there, there is some information about, um, let me share this slide. Um, if you were not in business uh, between February 15th and June 30th, your maximum loan is equal to 250% of your average monthly payroll costs between January 1, 2020, and okay, I'm sorry, this is a look back. My apologies. Um, I'm, I'm, I think if you were um, not in business that uh, they're going to, I'm not sure what they'll do with the, with the um, PPP loan, um, if it's even gonna qualify. I think that your best bet might be the EI, EIDL because they have said that they will look at startups in their mind 
you know, someone who has launched a business but is brand new, uh, could be a week old, two weeks old, um, but indicate that you're projecting an impact so they would, they would consider giving you a loan, potentially even that grant based on your projected in impact, even though you're brand new, you know, a startup company. So uh, the PPA, the PPP program with the loan through 7A, I, I don't know. I don't know how they might treat a startup. They probably would be a little, it would probably be a little more difficult. Um, you know, we haven't talked about it, but I do want to touch on it. A lot, a lot of conversation about the gig economy and independent contractors um, and how they uh, go about applying for uh, provisions of this program. Uh, let me, uh, I'll, I'll let Joe tackle um, part of that question, but I think one important thing to know is that the gig economy workers and independent contractors that would otherwise be ineligible for unemployment uh, are now going to be eligible for unemployment under this new program. Um, and I think that's uh, probably one of the understated things as people have been looking at this, but I think that will uh, certainly help out. But I, uh, from my reading of, of the act, they are are um, uh, eligible to uh, participate in this loan program as well. So I don't know whether whether Joe want to add anything to that, but I think it's a two-part component. You can get unemployment, but you can also apply for a loan in uh, uh, in this. Yeah, um, I, I can't really speak to the, um, you know, can you apply for both or how much can you apply for both, but uh, they have broadened the assistance to include a self-employed and 1099 contract employee employ, um, employees. So um, that you can borrow, um, but uh, whether you can borrow and also claim unemployment, I can't say for certain. I would rather not. Um, yes. But they did open it up for borrowing, which is positive. Uh, Mike, let me uh, throw a question to you. You know, it really is starting to becoming clear that there's lots of choices here. Uh, for business choices, if you take the loans or if you take the tax uh, breaks, how are people going to wade through that? Um, is it, uh, from what you're finding, extremely complex for the average business owner to just uh, look through it on their own? Yeah, unfortunately, I think the uh, major hurdle is that you don't know how long problems are going to persist with the economy because in the uh, uh, more level time, you would do a projection concerning where you think the uh, business is going to operate, then compare your options. Now we have to model that out under a number of different scenarios to see, you know, what the expectation is for revenue coming in, expenses going out, factor in the benefit of the, uh, the loan versus benefit of taking some of the uh, tax uh, provisions and make a determination of what seems to be the better course. Uh, unfortunately, it will be based upon modeling with different projections. Um, got a question here. Uh, again, this goes to the employment, so maybe Dan, you, uh, if, if you actually had to fire someone in the last couple of weeks, uh, does that impact you? Is there a way to differentiate on your baseline versus people you laid off because of the virus and other people who uh, let go of other various reasons? I know we already talked about someone resigning similar situation if someone were uh, severed? Yeah, the short answer is we don't know how that's really gonna impact the loans. Um, and we really need to see the implementation of that. Um, and, and so I think that the biggest thing we can say is to have, uh, to proceed with, with getting your paperwork done on the loans if that's something you wanna do. Uh, but um, wait for a few more details this week as, as some of this gets, gets fleshed out. Um, that's hard, I know. Um, it feels like every day I'm on the phone with people who are uh, really struggling and need to make decisions today, they feel like. But I think um, we've seen, this changed so much over just a, the last two weeks that I think a little bit of, of, of patience and thoughtfulness uh, here, um, it can go a long way. Um, I do wanna make people aware that uh, although I've just said patience is a watchword, um, the paid sick leave provisions do go into effect on April uh, 1st. Uh, that means you need to be providing a notice to your employees that's available on the Department of Labor website. Um, and you, 
really should understand that that's going to apply to every employer who has less than 500 uh, or so employees unless you fall within a health care exemption, an emergency responder exemption, or a small business exemption. So, um, you know, if you're looking at trying to prioritize, like, what do I need to take care of? Looking at this paid sick leave is coming up on Wednesday. So you've got tomorrow, really, to, uh, to look at it. We did have a question about how you go about getting that exemption if you are a uh, small business. Yeah, I saw that. I don't think you need to apply. I think it's a, an employer's good faith belief uh, that you apply. And I think um, you can either uh, go ahead at the beginning and sort of tell your employees uh, that uh, it doesn't apply. Or I, I think uh, the situation is when an employee um, uh, says they need to take leave, you can determine on that case-by-case -case basis whether um, you can really afford to pay them during that time. Um, just remember, nothing in, the, in that uh, federal law prevents you from paying someone, uh, from allowing them to use their paid time off. Um, they, they may be otherwise eligible for FMLA unpaid as well. So uh, you've got to understand the way all of this um, works together. And just because you might not uh, have an obligation under one law, you might still have it under another law um, to apply to, just to make things all the more confusing. Um, we're going to keep going for another about 10 minutes here. Um, let me just uh, throw a few more out. I, I did have someone say they sat on the phone for a really long time today with SBA. So I, I don't want to just send you off into the SBA uh, number. But as Joe was saying, if you can get through, that's a good uh, resource that they have here. Um, question also, uh, maybe Joe Williams, um, someone, if they started their application on the Connecticut uh, SBA website, uh, they too should uh, start again on the new uh, SBA website. Is that correct? Is it the actual SBA website they're talking about? The old one, the, the original EIDL? Uh, they just said Connecticut. They started theirs on the Connecticut. I don't know if that's that's even uh, the way yeah. it's actually set up, but. but. I don't know if they're talking about the express one that the Department of Economic and Community Development has out. That should have been applied, which is a separate uh, pool of money. But the feds, if they started the federal one on the EIDL, they should apply to the new one and go to the website that the two, um, PowerPoints that Joe pushed up, that's where they should go to. That's a good point. I uh, just want to mention, so DECD through the state of Connecticut, uh, a lot of people heard last week about the loan program they had that was a bridge loan up to $75,000 uh, that you could get. Uh, that was oversubscribed almost immediately. Uh, Joe Williams mentioned that, but that is a completely separate loan and loan process. Uh, so if you filled out that loan uh, application, that does not convert into anything that's going on that we're talking about here with SBA. So just don't want anyone under the false impression I filled out the state uh, loan form, it, therefore my application's already in with SBA. That is a completely different process, so important for people to know that. Um, question, any changes on interest rates? Um, you know, we, we have seen interest rates falling, uh, but they, the set fixed interest rates with the SBA programs those are exactly that, fixed, is that correct? Maybe Joe or Galano? I'm sorry, Garrett, fixed um, for the, the PPA? Yeah, uh, for all the programs that we've seen, all those interest rates that are listed by the federal government are fixed, correct? Those are not uh, going to be subject to, you know, if interest rates continue to fall, that you'll see those going down. All, well, all of the disaster programs, um, I believe, are fixed. 3.75 for EIDL and I think four, um, don't quote me, please, on the um, PPP 7A loan. Um, but, you know, in the past, there's been this calculation about your ability to get credit elsewhere which will influence the rate you're charged, but that I believe has been suspended for these two programs. Okay. So it's a fixed rate. Joe Williams, you agree, you're nodding? Yeah, that's a, that's a fixed rate. The 3.75 for small businesses and 2.75 for those nonprofits are the rate for the disaster of the EIDL program um, yeah. at this point in time. Um, I had this, uh, this question come up earlier today, uh, especially if you're with an employment agency where the employees uh, or temporary workers that work at a business 
um, but they're actually receive their paycheck through the employment agency. Uh, so I guess kind of two questions there, maybe Dan, you can hop on this. Um, first off, those temporary employees would not count towards the employer that they're working for. And then what happens with the employment agency that now, um, you know, if the uh, employer that they're providing those workers for does not need them, they're having uh, significant uh, layoffs that they, you know, cannot just continue to carry. Yeah, that's a good question. And, and one that I hadn't thought about from a, um, the PPP uh, side of things. I think from a, um, it, it'll, it'll go to a joint employment relationship. We've been hearing on the, uh, where the employer might use a PEO uh, to hire uh, people. You know, you're gonna have that discussion about who bears the responsibility uh, on unemployment uh, or on, on other benefits. Um, but I think I, I, we haven't yet looked at the impact of temporary employment um, on, uh, uh, sorry, the, the, the impact of the CARES Act on temporary employment. I do think that those employees are still going to be able to claim unemployment now, um, e even if um, they may not have been bought in. This federal fund really broadens the eligibility um, of, of even the 1099 contractors and the gig economy workers. So um, at the very least, the, uh, the temp agencies ought to be providing uh, separation slips for those people uh, to get unemployment. Uh, Mike, let me throw this one to you. Um, everyone should be aware, especially on the nonprofit side, there are variations between uh, the 501Cs and which ones uh, can use each specific program. Is that correct? I, I know uh, from firsthand uh, basis being a chamber at 501C6 uh, that we're not eligible for the Paycheck uh, Protection Program. 501C3s are. I'm sure there's some other variations in there. Yeah, there are also, uh, with respect to uh, uh, the actual tax benefits uh, and the employee retention credit exempts in that case can take the benefit of the employee retention credit. So that's a, a situation where uh, they're treated just like for profits. And uh, I, mean, I think that's a benefit that many people will, many companies will be uh, uh, looking to utilize. Great point. Um, any differentiations with real estate? Uh, and companies that are real estate holding uh, partnerships, any uh, specific rules for them? We had some questions about that. Anyone want to jump on that? Maybe Mike, that, I don't know if that falls within your, your area. Well, there, there's been an, a, a question raised concerning partnerships under the tax provisions. As we said, one of the major ones that affect real estate is the ability to uh, take bonus depreciation on qualified improvement property, which has been banned due to a legislative error uh, for 18 and 19. For partnerships, and most real estate entities are structured as partnerships for tax purposes, whether they're LLCs uh, or limited partnerships for state law purposes, they're, they're treated as partnerships for tax purposes. There is a uh, uh, an audit regime called the Centralized Partnership Audit Rules, which says that if you're a partnership subject to those rules and you go back and you amend a prior year as, and, the, and the amendment produces less income, instead of it passing out to the partners who would be able to then file amendments and get cash quickly, it becomes a deduction to the partnership going forward. So there's a technical problem here that I'm not certain was anticipated when they created this legislative fix to allow qualified improvement property, is that for partnerships that are subject to the centralized partnership audit regime rules, they may have to wait until they file their 2020 returns, and that those returns will be filed in 2021 before they could get the corresponding cash back due to that deduction. Now. Uh, Real estate uh, uh, organizations, as well as the American Bar Association, has gone to the uh, Treasury and pointed out this problem. I've been looking to see whether Treasury has authority uh, vested in it in order to come up with a change to the rules, and we'll see where that 
turns out. But partnerships are in a unique place under the tax rules under the law. And also there's a special rule with respect to the uh, investment, the business interest expense, which now you can take a larger amount of it. That won't apply to partners until year 2020 returns as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Dan, let me throw this one to you. Uh, we did talk about, you know, kind of hold off until you decide to rehire those workers, but how would that even work uh, if you laid off uh, a lot of employees? Um, you know, let's say you make that decision that you do want to bring them back based on uh, what you expect to get with the loan. What, any kind of uh, basic tips that uh, employers should know? Well, I, you know, I think um, the, the first thing is you should really be considering placing people on furloughs if you can. can. Uh, the advantage of a furlough, um, which by the way, the Department of Labor just this month and maybe over the last week has changed their pink slip form, uh, their UC61 form to now have a category for leave of absence uh, instead of just layoff. So uh, they're even recognizing that a uh, furlough, which is an unpaid leave of absence, allows you to keep someone uh, as a quote employee. So when you need to bring them back, it's really as simple as turning on a switch. Uh, for those people you've laid off, you do have to go through uh, typically a lot of the rehire onboarding that you would, the I-9s, the, the W-4s, all of those things. Um, and so that can be somewhat cumbersome. Uh, for employers. And that's why I said you're really going to need uh, to look at the math, look at the whole situation to see whether this is really worth it uh, for this short term uh, loan. If the business isn't there, uh, then bringing people on um, who, who don't have work may not be your best um, alternative. So um, the 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 CARES Act solves one problem, but it doesn't solve all of them that your business may have right now. So I think each business, rather than you know jumping into the program because it sounds good that there's money available, really needs to decide: is this going to help me in the long run? Right. Um, you know, and and that's a great point. I know it was made before too. Is just the uncertainty. I mean, we really don't even know uh, when things get better, and and even that's a relative term. Uh, what this economy looks like and what that means uh, for the way people uh, go about life and how they spend money and how our businesses operate. So it makes it just another layer that is so difficult to plan for as you're trying to uh, make these decisions. Um, we're running up against five o'clock, so we're going to end at five. I want to go to each of our panelists one more time, uh, kind of hear from them, uh, you know, one key takeaway uh, that they, they have. I, I should say for them, uh, I know uh, they'll, they'll say it themselves a disclaimer that you know they're providing general advice here and uh, really for any uh, specific issues that you have for your business, um, you don't wanna rely on the things that are said here, you wanna go uh, consult with uh, someone who's dealing specifically with your situation. Um, you know, a few things before I, I toss it back to them, you know, I, I jotted down earlier some key questions you wanna go through. Are you eligible for the programs? What type of information do you need to gather? Uh, these are things you can be doing right now, even as we wait for the uh, Paycheck Protection Program to open up. Uh, how do you calculate how much you can borrow? And then loan forgiveness and understanding the parameters. Again, those are some of the things we talked about uh, today during the call. Let me start, start with uh, Mike Daddio from Markham. Mike, again, thank you for joining us. Why don't you just tell us um, specifically what is, What's the number one tax uh, issue out there that people should be paying attention to and anything else you wanna wrap us up with from your end? Well, I think the, uh, the key issue uh, from a tax perspective is taking advantage of the rules that allow us to get immediate cash into the business, whether that's through refund claims, uh, which then should produce a, uh, checks from the government within a short period of time, or the employer uh, benefits under the retention credit, the payroll tax deferral, or if you're paying sick pay or extended family and medical leave, the fact that you can currently reduce your deposits by the amounts uh, that you would be eligible for because the sick pay and the extended family and medical leave is supposed to be borne entirely by the federal government through a refund. So if you're going to 
Uh, you don't want to wait until you file your quarterly returns to get the money back. So you can reduce your deposits by essentially an advance against the credit. And if you have enough in other payroll deposits, including income tax withholding on other employees, then you'll get your money currently. If that's short of what you're paying out on sick leave, then for the balance, you would uh, file a uh, refund claim to get the money back as quickly as possible. But I think from a tax perspective, it's paying attention to those provisions that allow us to get cash back to the business as quickly as possible. Thanks, Mike. We appreciate it. Uh, Joe Williams, let me go to you next, and then uh, Joe Arcolano. I just want to remind everyone that, you know, the, my colleagues and I are available as, once again, at ctsbdc.com. Feel free to sign up on our website. We do have our resource center there, which is a breadth of information and some videos that are there. Uh, once again, we are free um, government resources to you. Feel free to contact us. We're more than happy to walk you through the process and walk through some of the things that Garrett has alluded to to help you with the process. Um, there's our website. Joe just put it up there. Um, ctsbc.com, the Business Resource Center. Feel free to go there at any time. In the in the upper right hand corner, where it says just press on the button to request a business advisor to be assigned to you. We are all over the state of Connecticut. We are telecommuting. We can do a Zoom or some type of other webinar if you want to see us in person. Um, unfortunately, we cannot see you in any other way um, under the conditions. But we're here to help you and we want to know that we're here for you and we're going to get through this together. Joe, Joe Arcolano. Yeah, Garrett, thanks for doing this uh, webinar. Um, very, very well done and uh, it's great attendance. So I just want to like, echo what Joe said. We are here to help. We are not going to give you in-depth specialized services like Dan's firm or Mike's firm. Um, we're not equipped to do that, and that's not our purpose. Our purpose is to help you pull your applications together, get your numbers put, put in line, get the statements you need, talk through your strategies, and, and keep in mind, as was alluded to, when all this settles down and things come back a little bit more to normal, um, what your business plan, your strategy is going forward in a different world, because the world will be different. And uh, it may be better for some businesses, or it may not change a lot, but it may be a lot more challenging for others. So keep us on mind as, a, as an ongoing resource and we'll be happy to uh, try to help whatever we can. And don't panic about the money. There will be more money coming out of Washington, I'm sure. <laughs> um, I think most of those elected officials know that this was a multi-phase effort. Okay. Thanks, yeah. Joe, appreciate it. Dan? Yeah, I would uh, sort of echo what's been said and, and understand that a lot of us have been putting up resources um, or looking at resources um, at various sites. So Connecticut has, I think, done a really great job uh, on their uh, various websites to answer a lot of questions. So the Department of Labor has an FAQ uh, on there. And if you go to ct.gov, there's a coronavirus link there. Our firm has put up uh, daily client alerts that are available to anyone uh, on this that answer really specific questions that you might not find on the government. Uh, we just put up guidance uh, yesterday on the Department of Labor's um, questions and answers on uh, on this. So that's shipmentgoodwin.com. Uh, I have a blog that I update now on almost on a daily basis that provides employment law uh, links as well. That's CT uh, employment law blog as well. Uh, and there are many, many other resources out there. So I, I think before you sort of panic, um, look up some of the resources, try to get that information, um, and then try to make the best decisions um, as well, consulting your attorneys, your financial advisors, or your your banks. Great. Well, I, I want to thank all of our panelists, uh, including Senator Murphy, who joined us today. Uh, we really threw this together uh, just yesterday, but we felt like the demand for information is so great out there that we wanted to put out as much as we could. I hate that we don't have complete answers for everything, uh, but you know that is still in the works, and it, it's a work in progress. And I think right now, the only things you can do are follow the steps that we talked about gather all the information that you can possibly have so that you're poised and ready as soon as that portal opens for Paycheck Protection Program, you can jump on it. Please, right now, you can still do the economic injury disaster loans, work through those, uh, work through the professionals, 
support through the Connecticut SBDC. Uh, I want to let everyone know we are doing more of these webinars. We continue to do them. Uh, generally, two to three of these a week. We have another one coming up on Tuesday at 10 a.m. That's in the hospitality and restaurant uh, area and things that you can do in that sector. Obviously, really devastated uh, by so much that has occurred. Uh, our Nonprofit Resource Council will meet on 10 a.m. on Thursday, so another webinar, and we'll continue to push the information on that out. Please go to our website, both the Quinnipiac Chamber of Commerce and the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce. And we're so glad that you uh, joined us. And again, we'll keep on doing these. Uh, we will get through this, but I know the economic pain right now is significant for everyone. And so we're trying to help as much as we possibly can. Hope everyone has a good night. And again, thank you to, for everyone who joined us and thank you to our panelists. And we will have a recording of this webinar up on our website uh, either later tonight or first thing tomorrow morning uh, so people can take another look at it. Thanks again. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, Garrett. Thank you, Garrett. Thanks, Garrett. Thank you, Garrett. Hey, Garrett, do you think we can get a list, a, a list of the questions? Oh, yeah. Yep. Because if so, we can uh, get that list, we can start to get questions up to SBA and other places, too. Okay. Yeah. Would be great. great. Yeah, I'll Thanks. do that.